Hello and welcome to the Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by my co-host, Lance LaDuke. Lance, how are you? I'm so happy. The sun is out, which happens six times a year uh, in Pittsburgh between October and May. And this is one of those days. So I'm very, very excited to be in my basement. Six times a year between October and May. <laughs> okay, it comes out in the summer. We have the sun. Like Then it'll show up. But basically okay. during most of the school year, it is uh, just something that you hear about. You don't actually see. It's rumored. Yeah, I yeah, that's uh Pittsburgh is uh, one of the great American cities and it is very much in spite of what you just said. Amen to yeah, that. Yeah. So, how are how you doing? Like how are your feelings? My feelings, well, I feel like um mostly fulfilled. Um Do I'm you? a little melancholy because uh yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not bad. Duncan <laughs> is uh my son is about to graduate from high school here in a couple of months, which is shocking. We've uh He's going to go to the University of Pittsburgh, so he won't be that far away, which is good. And, oh, I thought maybe you didn't think he was going to graduate. No, I'm pretty sure he's going to graduate. He'll have to really screw up. There's still time. There's time. He's a trombone player. So Nature and nurture, either one. They're, they're yeah. both your fault. Flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Andrew? Uh, I'm. Thank you for asking, Lance. You're welcome. I, I I appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm actually uh, I'm actually a little nervous, which is good. I don't get nervous about tuba engagements too often, but I am uh, in uh, two days' time when this releases. I'm going to be sharing the stage with the uh, U.S. Army Blues and Swamp Woo. Rump. Uh, yeah, at the uh, the Army Tuba Euphonium Workshop, which is actually going to be streamed live on the internet so you can uh, find that at 7 30 p.m on thursday the 6th this is coming out on tuesday and uh gonna be with uh, joe dollard and i'm uh, playing a fish tune with swamp romp which is gonna be awesome uh arranged by trey anastasio's arranger and my dear friend don hart um so yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome so i'm uh, i'm looking forward to it but you know they say you're supposed, to, you're supposed to get on you know you, ideally you get on stage with people that are like all better than you you know mm -hmm. and um yeah not to sound like an ass but that doesn't happen all that often anymore because <laughs> i've been doing this a long time but that on thursday night that is definitely going to be the case which is pretty cool so that's yeah, awesome yeah get you out of your comfort zone it's uh yeah it's 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 good so um, but let's get back to you how are how are your feelings are they you good My feelings um yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good, I think. Uh, Our, I don't care. Yeah. Our guest today is yeah. Dr. Gretchen. Well, you know, sometimes Gretchen. I feel like I'm just not sure if I'm doing the right thing, but Dr. Gretchen, I mean, by and large, I... Dr. Gretchen Renshaw James, who this was a fantastic conversation. She is... Uh, I'm doing terribly. I feel terrible. She is a, she is a conductor. She plays I, with surf brass. She does, she, she does... She does... She does a lot of stuff. She just recently announced this grant that she's got coming up. Um, and uh, yeah, save it for somebody who cares, Lance. Uh, this was a great. This was a great conversation that I think that you are all going to uh, to really love. Uh, the bonus episode that where we talked to her was also wonderful. You can see a complete listing of all of the guests that we have done a bonus episode with, which is like 40 people long now. If you go to pedalnotemedia.com slash bonus, you click on any one of those, there's a link to our Patreon page. We are talking uh, Martin McCain, Wayne Dumaine, uh Matt Neese, John Abrachamento, Tim Busby, uh, the uh, uh, what was it? Chalet, Chalet Abate, Chalet Abate, uh, Abate. Yes, um, yeah. There's it, we we it's it's always a little bit light, a little informal. So uh, we had uh, we next week will be the bonus episode with Gretchen. Thank you to everyone who has uh, left a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your episodes of the Brass Junkies. Thank you for subscribing. And uh, I think that that is it. I liked her advice for for uh, Jens as well. So you well, got to stay tuned yeah. for that. So without further ado, let us get to the conversation that we had with Dr. Gretchen Renshaw James. <laughs> And 
Today on The Brass Junkies, we are joined by a conductor, by a tuba player, by a, a huge presence in our industry, and her name is Gretchen Renshaw-James. Gretchen, how are you this morning? Doing well, thanks. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you're a conductor who can actually play your ass off. That's like that. That's that's good. There's there's a lot that can't do that. A lot of them, uh, you know, they they couldn't play like you do, and then they were like, "I'm going to swing this thing instead." And then some of those become amazing conductors, but you can actually do both, which is pretty cool. Well, that's very kind of you. I, it's honestly as a matter of practicality, really. I was studying euphonium initially, and then I added on the tuba at the recommendation of my teacher, Velvet Brown, so that I could just diversify what I was doing. Then I'm getting into grad school. I'm looking ahead to the college job market and seeing just how competitive it is to get a tuba and euphonium teaching college job. I'm realizing that conducting is something I enjoy doing anyway, so I decided to start studying that more seriously. And honestly, because of conducting, that's why I was able to get my start in the college teaching world. So then I just kept playing tuba on my own. There's a brass band in the area called Natural State Brass Band, which I'm actually the conductor of as well. And then uh, out of the blue, Mary Bowden is emailing me asking if I'd be interested and willing to join Serif Brass on a couple of tours. So I did that. And it's just been this this pathway of, like I said, initially out of practicality, pursuing the conducting route, and then having this incredible tuba playing opportunity just drop out of the sky. So I feel very fortunate to have been getting to do both of those things re- recently. Hmm. We were commenting before the show that she has lots of very important looking papers framed behind her on the wall. <laughs> I, I, you know what I have framed? I have framed like posters of sports accomplishments that I had nothing to do with. So yeah. And like, <laughs> what do I have? <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, yeah. What does Lance have? I have pictures of my children. Oh, that's just, that's just, and my to, father. Yeah. And you're, Oh, Oh, he just, he just honors his family. I roll. Me? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I honor it so much that I didn't remember what was back there. I had to look. <laughs> oh, I recognize them. Like, who's that guy? Oh, yeah, it's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you go to school, Gretchen? Well, I started at Penn State where I was studying with Velvet Brown, sure. and that was primarily as a euphonium player. And then I went to the University of Arkansas to study with Ben Pierce, He's which decent. is... Yeah, you know, uh, one of Velvet's former students as well. And so initially, again, pursuing a euphonium master's degree officially, but playing just as much tuba as euphonium those days. And then I went to Michigan State for my DMA in tuba. And while I was there, I discovered that it was also possible to pursue a master's degree in conducting at the same time. Possible. Very difficult because it was a lot of things to do over the course of three years, but I'm very thankful that I I had the opportunity to do both of those degrees at the same time. Wow. So you have two two euphonium degrees, one tuba degree, and a conducting degree. That's right. (laughs) Lance, I think she... Well, yeah, she should be interviewing us, although we're not interesting enough to be interviewed. So yeah, maybe maybe she should just interview herself. (laughs) <laughs> she has twice as many degrees as we do. Yes, combined. <laughs> uh, which of those degrees? Well, your DMA was your first tuba degree. What yes. was more difficult for you, getting the tuba degree or getting the conducting degree? Since you had not done much of either of those before you started that degree. I think, honestly, they were both equally difficult. I came in, I remember going into Michigan State and Professor Phil Cinder, you know, he accepted me into the studio, but uh, Phil Cinder, you know, <laughs> Phil Cinder, tuba professor up at uh, Michigan he was my, State. He was my teacher. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Yeah, so in one of our, in one of our first lessons, he's saying, you know what, let's just not worry about a tuba recital this semester. Let's just really focus on some good fundamentals and making sure the the tuba is really strong. And I said, okay, that's why I'm here studying with you because you know what things I need to get better at the tuba. And he was right. I printed out a fingering chart for you, Gretchen. (laughs) I had that part down. It was just, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I had been playing tuba 
at a relatively equal, well, an equal amount of time anyway, to the euphonium during my master's degree. But I really appreciated the opportunity then that I had to focus pretty exclusively on it, especially at the beginning of that DMA, because it was just, the tuba was just lagging behind the euphonium at that time. So it was good. That's a good teacher, obviously, too, that, yeah. <laughs> that allowed you to not do a recital the first semester and to just focus on basics because the, yeah. the whole the same with conducting, right? You got to there's mm-hmm. certain things that you have to master or else when you're trying to fine tune when the foundation ain't there, then it's just not going to. Yeah, it's not going to end nearly as successfully as it could if you take the time to do it right. Right, right. There you go. And, he, and he, yeah, he he uh, he did a good job with Lance. I hate to say it, but <laughs> Phil's awesome. What a great, what a great player yeah. too. The guy's yeah. just a machine. Mm-hmm. He, he was still a kid when I got there. He was yeah. like maybe I think ten years older than I was. So he was late, mm-hmm. late twenties. Uh, okay. And he wow. was the young guy on campus, and now mm-hmm. he's not. <laughs> he is experienced. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and now yeah. he's not. Uh, I had a great time. Uh, he he, yeah, he put me on the map. He really uh, <laughs> laid a foundation, and he's just—it's mm-hmm. all just so like calm, and he just yep. thinks things through and mm-hmm. says a few words, and he's like, "Oh, dang it! Okay, fine." <laughs> Speaking, Lance, of uh, of not being the young guy uh, anymore, I was just up at uh, Westchester University and um, and visited uh, Jonathan Fowler's school, and um, and he played a gig with Rojack like a couple of months ago. And uh, and Rojack hadn't seen him in like 13 years, and uh, and Jonathan has quite a bit of gray hair now. He's in his he's in his early 40s, but he's got quite a bit of gray hair. And uh, and Rojack <laughs> saw him. He went sat down and he looked at him and he said, "You look distinguished." <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was like, I need to tell Lance that. Yep, that's so, awesome, right? That's pretty funny. I hadn't seen him since he was like 30, and that was what he opened with: was "You look distinguished." So. And, English. and Fowler was like, thank you. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, what, what was it like studying with how, well, how much training did you have before you got to Penn state? Like what, what was it like studying with velvet? I'm a huge fan of hers and I've never actually seen her teach, but I know how she approaches things and I'm sure she's an incredible pedagogue, but like, what was it like studying with her? I think the biggest thing for me was the way she encouraged me in a bunch of different areas. So early on, she was encouraging me to try some competitions and go after other grants and things at Penn State. So she just had this way, the way that we connected, I found her to be a very motivating kind of influence for me. So I will always tell folks that she is the person who's really responsible for starting this kind of entrepreneurial type of spirit that I have in terms of, oh, there's a grant out there. I wonder if there's some cool project that I would be interested in doing that would fit the needs of that grant. I don't know. I'm going to try it and see what happens. And so those are the kinds of things that she helped me with in terms of like bigger picture life and career readiness kinds of things. From a planning standpoint, I can tell you that there are so many things that I learned in lessons with her that I'm using today, not only for my own playing, but in masterclass settings and lessons, all kinds of just basic, good fundamental principles that I still come back to today. Her notes on a line thing, the idea of having a consistent stream of air going through the music is really huge. And I use that with my students all the time and also to remind myself too. So, um, She was the one who got me started on the pathway towards mouthpiece buzzing. I know everybody's got different opinions on that, but I've become a big mouthpiece buzzer. And she forced me through the early days of my mouthpiece buzzing in which I was mouthpiece buzzing. And I didn't want to do mouthpiece buzzing because I was so bad at it. But she made me keep doing it. And now I find a lot of benefits out of it. So some really important foundational stuff. And then, oh, man, one of the things that that I heard a lot from her is it's not enough just to play the notes and play things technically well. I was pretty good at doing that uh, even in the early days of my, my Penn State career, so to speak, but she was always pushing for the greatest possible musicality. And if I were to play something robotically, 
I remember very clearly a, a chamber music rehearsal where I, I thought I played the heck out of the first euphonium part to this really hard arrangement that we did. And the first thing she said to me after that is, you can't play like a robot ever again. That was what she cared about. <laughs> I read this thing really well. And so what she was concerned about, even from the read, is you have to give your musical self to this, this thing, even if you're just sight reading it, no matter what you're doing it has to have some kind of musical intent behind mm. it. So yeah, those are some of the big picture things. Can, from you, can you talk about the, the music, the notes on a line thing? I haven't heard that. Before. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it was her way of teaching us how to play legato passages in particular. So Roshu etudes were very common in the studio or the Bordoni bel canto etudes for the tuba players. So in order to teach us how to play with this smooth, consistent line of air, she tried to get us to think that here's, here's a note, here's your first note, and then the next note is farther in front of you and a little higher, so to speak, and then farther and higher and so on and so forth. And what she was trying to combat was all of us in the studio who would have the tendency to football, like where each little note did that kind of a thing, mm -hmm. right? So notes on a line was her way to help us understand how to blow through the notes. And my initial interpretation of it was I felt like I was always playing on a little bit of a crescendo, which was kind of right. She was teaching us phrasing at the same time that she was teaching us the technique of playing with a really smooth line. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, well, then let's uh, go another step uh, and have you talk about the mouthpiece buzzing. So what, what, mm -hmm. why I, I've kind of, I go back and forth. I run hot and cold on it and mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've used it and currently I haven't been, but um, what's your thinking on it? Well, my approach to mouthpiece buzzing well, first of all, is just knowing and understanding that it is going to be at least somewhat different than playing the instrument because you just don't have that big metal resonant tube <laughs> to attach to the mouthpiece. So just going in knowing that it is going to be different. But after I do some stretching and breathing to warm up every day, it is the very next thing that I do. And so what I'm trying to do with it is to establish a good, efficient embouchure for the day. And I know when I'm doing that, because of the lengths of phrases that I will play on the mouthpiece. So I have an exercise that I use that starts out with just four or five notes. And as I warm up more, I gradually add more and more and more notes. And I'm using the middle range all the way down to the pedal range, all the way up to the highest part of my range. And I know that by the end of it, if I'm working things and getting things into their most efficient shape for the day, that I'll be able to play pretty long phrases I'll be able to play in any of the ranges and so that's what I'm looking for for myself so what I think it does for me is the efficiency of the efficiency of the embouchure and it also helps get my air connected with playing right away in the beginning of the day because obviously if the buzz isn't working you're probably not blowing consistent air if the buzz is not getting you the pitches you want you're not blowing the right kind of speed of air so it's all of those things combined and a really short amount of warm up time, which sometimes happens on serif tours. We get to a hall and we just don't have much time and we got to rehearse really soon after. Mouthpiece buzzing is one of the things I won't give up. Um, I might not get to play any long tones on the tuba, but if I can at least get the mouthpiece buzzing going a little bit, I know that I'm going to be at least in decent shape for the rehearsal. How much time are you spending a day on that, ideally? <sighs> it can oh, range. range yeah. yeah, it can range from. 10 minutes to 20 minutes because I will really do it based on how things are working that day. So if they aren't working really well, I'll spend more time on it until I get myself to the point where I feel like I'm ready. And then in terms of your teaching, how, um, how are you, like, what do you assign? What do I assign? Yeah. I mean, well, how do you teach it? Yeah. With my students, I try to get them going on just the short version of the exercise first and I'm listening and trying to help them understand what kind of sound I want them to get on the mouthpiece. I'm doing the trick where you put a piece of paper in front of the mouthpiece and the students are playing and they have to keep the piece of paper moving as an indicator that the air is moving well. So I start with the really short exercises, try to develop it within an octave's worth of range and then we keep expanding, keep adding notes in both as we directions, go. Yeah. 
You know what helps with uh, buzzing is uh, when you use a Parker mouthpiece, which just conveniently provides the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Mm. Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. Actually, if you play either the Hitz or the the LeDuc, you don't even have to do any of those exercises that she talked about. That's how good it is. You can just skip it. And then you can buzz as well as Gretchen did, like at the end of her time at Penn State. You just skip the work. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, that that's yeah. You have to read the fine print there. But anyway, you can find out more at uh, ParkerMouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I would encourage all of you to um, Gretchen. We occasionally will. Uh, Michael Parker was my college roommate, and so we will occasionally um, because I love him so much. I'll will encourage the audience to email him about ridiculous things. And um, I think that uh, I think that we should have people go to the website. And uh, and ask him, um, like, say that you heard that he heard about a shortcut that you can take to getting great on a brass instrument, and ask him what the shortcut is. That's that's what you all need to. If like fifty people do that, I will be so happy that I will literally be moved to tears. So everyone, email Parker, <laughs> ask him what the what the say. You don't have time to practice, but you want to be great. I want to play the tuba like Gretchen. What's the shortcut? So um, I think that that's very important. So mm-hmm. yeah. uh, <laughs> awkwardly segueing into that into, into that ad that we needed to read anyway was like it was such low hanging fruit. I was like, I, yeah, I, I have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was like pro podcaster. Oh, I've, absolutely. And you're supposed to point out afterwards how pro it was. That's like mm-hmm. that's super pro. That's like the equivalent of having yep. four degrees in podcasting is when you do the smooth <laughs> segue and then you point out how smooth the segue was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I want to make sure that we leave uh, plenty of time for um, for this, which of course now the note is not up. All right, so Gretchen has been on uh, our list of people that we have wanted to hit up for this, and I'd love to. We're not going to have time to get to everything. I'd love to talk to you about your conducting as well. But you had a Facebook post from whatever that was three, four, five days ago, uh, and that was what made me say I'm going to reach out to her right now, uh, and so I'm going to just read the Facebook post. Uh, Which is, now that things have become official, I'm thrilled to share that I've been granted the Nancy and Craig Wood Odyssey Professorship at Hendricks College for 2020 through 2023. It is a huge honor to receive this award, and it will provide significant funding for me to undertake a major project. My project is called Diverse Voices in Music, and it's all about promoting and increasing diversity in the world of classical music, particularly in the area of wind band and brass instrument performance. The project will include commissioning new works for band, residencies by composers and guest artists, and finally a solo tuba CD for which I will commission new works. All of these events will feature composers and artists of diverse backgrounds. Along the way, there will be opportunities for Hendrix students to serve in professional development and leadership roles to organize and manage these complex events. Looking forward to a very exciting three years. Thank you, Hendrix College, for this incredible opportunity. Uh, and end quote. First of all, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Really Thank great. You. Uh, I you're uh, you're preaching to the converted here, but I would love to give you an opportunity to put it into your own words. Why is promoting diversity in music and in particular in, in wind band and brass instrument performance? Why is that important? I first became really interested in this topic when someone named Rob Deemer started his composer diversity project He's and awesome. perhaps yeah perhaps a number of folks might be familiar with him and his work. So I started looking and seeing what he was doing and it's all very research and fact-based. He spends time researching, for example, the major orchestras and the kinds of music they perform, the composers who they're performing. And his research was just bringing to light for me a broader issue in the classical music world that it tends to be that we perform music by Caucasian male composers. They have been in the majority for a number of years, and that's it's fine. That's how it is. But what I appreciate is uh, what he's doing is trying to not only bring that to light, but then provide resources for folks to help make a change in that. So I'm sitting here as a female conductor 
which is certainly an underrepresented demographic in the conducting world. Mm -hmm. Sitting here as a female tuba player, again, underrepresented Mm -hmm. demographic in the tuba world. And seeing this research, seeing what he's talking about, I attended the Midwest Clinic a few years ago and saw three separate presentations on this topic and just found myself being very moved to contribute to this broader effort in some way. And so for me, this is something we've already started doing at Hendrix with my regular yearly funding. We've been making efforts already to make sure that our wind ensemble concert programs feature the music of diverse composers. And the reason this is so important has a lot to do with representation. I'll never forget the one day we were in rehearsal. I have a Uh, an African-American percussionist who tends to be a very active person. She's running around back there, you know, setting up her equipment and doing all this kind of stuff. And I was explaining and talking about a piece called Summerland by William Grant Still, an African-American composer. And I was talking about him. I was talking about how he was one of the first to really break through in the classical music world as an African-American composer. And for a person who runs around in the back all the time, she just stopped dead in her tracks and was just hanging on to everything I was saying about him, why he was important, and why we need to play his music. And what I was saying that day is that we we can't get his voice without his experience and his upbringing, which had to do with hearing gospel music in part of his life right up against classical concert hall kind of music. So the argument that, argument, so to speak, I I put that in in quotes, but the, the point that I'm trying to make to my wind ensemble folks when we play this different music is so that we can connect with different experiences, different perspectives. It's good for us personally to try to delve into what are those experiences like so that we can be perhaps more well-rounded people. So it's a number of different things that I'm, I'm thinking about, the representation aspect and the idea of how can we connect with people who are different from us? How can we understand their experiences? And I think ultimately bring greater variety into the music that we're playing because their variety of experiences is going to, in many cases, play out in musical variety as well. Oh, I love it. Go so ahead. what what is the um, <clears throat> at the end of three years, you you, you alluded to the the, the things mm-hmm. that will be accomplished, including the recording. So how yeah. many compositions mm-hmm. are you looking to have commissioned, or what what is the full scope of the project? I guess would be the easiest way to say that. Yeah, well, I think probably the easiest thing for me to do is give a little synopsis of what will happen in each year. So next year, the big thing that we're going to be doing is just buying a lot of music for our band library here so that we have music from diverse composers to draw upon. One of the things that's important in the professorship uh, proposal process is to think about ways that the project can live beyond the three years that it's actually officially happening. So that's one of the ways that we're going to do that to make sure our library is well stocked for not only the next three years, but for years to come with good quality music by diverse composers that we can keep uh, returning to. And then during that year, a lot of what's going to be happening as well is planning for the commissions that we're going to do. So we are going to to commission three composers to write three pieces of band music specifically for my ensemble because, well, we're commissioning it and I want to make sure that it fits them well, both from a difficulty level and from an instrumentation standpoint. And I'm going to seek out, again, composers who represent diverse backgrounds. We're going to commission those three pieces. We're going to bring those composers to campus. We're going to also have Skype rehearsals with them before they come so that we can connect with them on their music. And then when they come, it will just you know make the experience that much better because we already know them. And in the second year, One of the ways that this is going to intersect with my tuba playing life is we're going to bring Seraph Brass to campus and also a composer, Catherine Saulfelder. So right now, Seraph Brass is working on a commissioning consortium. We are commissioning Catherine Saulfelder, composer based in the New England area, to write a brass quintet concerto with either wind band or orchestral accompaniment. So we're working on building that consortium right now. But because of this grant, Hendrix is going to join the consortium. And then we're going to bring Seraph Brass here to play that concerto. We're going to bring Catherine Saulfelder here as well. Um, 
Um, and then we are going to bring in a guest conductor because if I'm going to be playing with Seraph with the wind ensemble, I obviously can't conduct them. So it presents this really great opportunity for a guest conductor to come in. So that's kind of one of the highlights of the second year. And then the third year is going to be primarily devoted to the tuba CD recording project. I have to work out from a, a funding perspective and composer interest perspective exactly how many pieces I'll be able to commission. But the idea for the CD is to combine newly commissioned works with existing works and record those. And in the lead up to the recording, I am hoping to be able to tour around to different colleges, high schools maybe, to present this program and kind of to present the project and the broader effort as a whole. So that's kind of a synopsis of what's going to happen over the next three years with this. Okay, here's a, a question. One thing I wonder is if some uh, conductors would say, well, it's just too difficult for me to find these pieces, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to go about doing that um, mm -hmm. as an obstacle or an excuse for not programming with more diversity. So mm -hmm. how do you respond to, to that uh, approach or that thought? Well, fortunately, especially because of Rob, D Rob Deemer's work and some others, there are resources that are becoming available. And these are some of the things that I learned about when I attended the Midwest Clinic. I think before I talk about the resources, though, I just want to say that I think conductors, we just all have to admit that the process of learning about new music takes time. And that that is difficult. How many conductors will say, oh man, I'm so busy. I just don't have time to do this, that, or the other thing. Mm. And it's true. But if you want to make some kind of effort in this direction, you just have to go in knowing it's going to take some time because you do have to listen to these pieces. You have to decide if they're going to work for your group, if they are of the highest kind of quality that you want to present to your group. So once you are comfortable with that. Once you know it's going to take some time to learn about these new pieces, then you need to take a look at Rob Deemer's Composer Diversity Institute webpage. He has made this incredibly useful where you can select all different kinds of things. I want to look for music that composers have written for band. I would like to look for music by living composers. I would like them to be from these particular demographics. There are so many different filters you can set, so you can really zero in on a particular kind or style of music that you're looking for, a particular kind of composer. So that's one idea. And another resource that I've been using a lot recently is put together by someone named Jody Blackshaw. She oh. is an Australian composer. I know Jody a little bit. And she, yeah, she has a website called Colorful Music, C O L O U R F U L L is how she spells that. And on her website, she has put together, with the help of band directors from all over the world, sample programs of ways to incorporate music by these diverse composers, overall programs, overall concert themes. And one of the things that not only she talked about, but those clinics I saw at the Midwest Clinic, one of the things that was very important to them, and it's important to me too, is that while we make efforts in this direction of diversifying the music that we play, we also need to make sure or keep an eye to making sure that we're being inclusive. It's actually not great. There were arguments being made at the Midwest Clinic presentations that it's actually not great to program a concert of women, all women composers or all, you know, you name it, composers. Because what it does is it then separates them off and it, and it right. makes it this thing like, oh, we have to treat them specially or separately. Right. But really what the most powerful way to go about it seems to be is including their music right alongside all the other composers who are maybe more mainstream, who are maybe more commonly performed. So it's like their music deserves to be right alongside those folks and not often its own little corner. So that's something too, that while we are going to focus on bringing more diverse voices to the table in this Odyssey professorship project, our concerts are going to feature music also of Caucasian male composers. And that's how I think it should be. Hmm. So I, I could give a 10 minute answer to this question, but what do you say? <laughs> let's, well, let's be honest. How many questions, Lance, do you think I could not give a 10 to hundred minute answer? Uh, <laughs> I didn't say any of it makes sense, but I, I've never shy of microphones. What, what do you say to, 
uh, a critic who would say, why do you need to promote diversity? If it's any good, then the market will 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 program it all by itself. How do you respond to that argument? It, or do you even respond to that argument? Is it even worth responding to? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, that is a tough one. Well, I think one of the things we have to admit in this process is – what is the music that we have been used to hearing to mm -hmm. this point? What is the music that's been programmed to this point? Mm -hmm. Has there been enough room, daylight through the trees, so to speak, that other voices can come through? Are we willing to admit that throughout history, it's been the, com the compositional world has been largely dominated by Caucasian male composers? I think if we admit that, and just accept that as, well, that is how it's been, but then also realize the importance of including those other diver those other voices, perhaps then we start to gain some ground. I have wondered in taking various music history courses, I mean, yes, we know about Beethoven, right? His music became very well known, but what if there were some other great composers who were around during that time, male, female, doesn't matter. What if there were some other composers around during that time who maybe they weren't as savvy or as connected with the right people and their music for whatever reason just didn't get out there, but it was still really good. Right. I bet there are those people throughout history. And I think those people exist today. And it's because of the kinds of connections or opportunities that might exist for certain composers or certain groups of people that maybe there are voices that are unintentionally being stifled because they just don't have access to the same kinds of opportunities. We talk about that in a broader context, the idea of access to opportunities because of you know various social inequalities that occur. It's, I think it's all part of a bigger conversation. I don't think it's I don't think it's just because somebody's music is really high quality stuff. I don't think that necessarily means it's going to get out there. I think that those people and those composers, those folks need the help of people to believe in them, people to put their music out there in a way that it can gain the same kind of recognition as mm -hmm. the composers who are already out there and already have that recognition. That was very well put, and you said more than I would have said in way less time. So, <laughs> <laughs> which admittedly isn't that high of a bar, but you still cleared that bar like with with ease. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, I stuck a link to both the Institute for Composer Diversity and mm. the Colorful Music in the show notes. Oh, super! Thank you. And uh, you know what? Speaking of the show notes, Andrew. <laughs> Yes, ma There's a link to the uh, wonderful folks at the Mary Papert School of Music at Duquesne University. Hey. And if you follow that link, you'll be taken to a page created just for listeners. No kidding. Just it's, for listeners? Yeah, it's just, just for listeners. Wow. If you watch so Gretchen the podcast, not you are there. not able to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Gretchen, don't. No guess. No, no. And uh, you'll find out about all of the uh, tremendous uh, faculty, the performing opportunities and everything uh, and more. The tremendous faculty and Jim Nova. And in Jim Nova. Um, <clears throat> and so please take a moment. And after you've looked at those other links, click on the cl cl click, click on that link. What? I don't know. I'm not sure. Click and, uh, and go visit. And very, very, very special, warm, heartfelt, deep, sincere, genuine, not at all demeaning or sarcastic at all. Thanks to Jim. <laughs> honest to God, Nova, <laughs> for making it possible. <laughs> Jim, honest to God, Nova. I like it. There we go. Jim gets a new a new nickname every uh, every episode. So yeah, we um, we we love him. And uh, I don't know. There's there's some there's some things to unpack here. But the people that Lance and I care about the most is we, we yeah. like. We make fun of them a lot, and we lot. try, and we even when we have to say nice things about them, we preface it by saying, "I don't like to say nice things." It's like there's some there's some stuff to unpack there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are some regular listeners going, "You think?" They're like screaming at their car stereos right now. Uh, <laughs> So let's, uh, I mean, I could talk to you about what we were just talking about for a very long time, uh, but let's, I want to hear about your, about your conducting. What, what is your favorite part about conducting? If there, if it can be boiled down that, that much, but what do well, you love about uh, it? I think that I've been drawn to it because 
of the opportunity to share music with a larger group of people. So when we're in private lessons, obviously it's a one-on-one kind of situation or or chamber groups, maybe three to six people coaching a, a chamber group. But with conducting, there's an opportunity to reach much larger group of folks. And I find that to be really rewarding in whatever setting it happens to be, whether it's the natural state brass band that I conduct in Little Rock or whether it's the Hendrix Wind Ensemble. So I find a lot of joy in in taking the time myself to study the score, to learn the music, and then sharing that with a large group of folks and trying to figure out how can we all come to the same kind of understanding of this piece of music? How can we all really live it and breathe it and then share the message of that piece with our audience? So I guess what I love about it, honestly, is the challenge of doing that. It's conducting is as much about the leadership aspect as anything. Yes, there's the arm waving. Yes, there's the score studying and there's all that stuff. But really, it comes down to how can I motivate this group of 35 or 40 people in front of me to believe in this music and to commit to the musical ideas that the composer has given us? And then, of course, our interpretation of those ideas. And then how can we share that kind of energy and excitement with the audience? So I guess what I would say really, in summary, is, is I enjoy the challenge of it. It's, it's very tough to do all of that. Yeah, but you just nailed it where you talked about how you have to get the the uh, people in the ensemble to commit to yeah what they're what they're doing, which is so much more yeah. than just well what Velvet talked to you about, right? Sounds like you could mm-hmm. operate the crap out of a euphonium when you got there and yet that maybe the rest of it which is really the, the the real interesting part was maybe lagging a little bit behind, and uh, it can be the same with in wind ensemble, right? Where you can play the notes and oh, certainly. it takes a great conductor to be able to challenge everyone equally the people who the top of that band the bottom the middle all of that to all be buying in at one time that's uh you have to be empowering you have to be demanding you have to be supportive you have to uh, there's a lot of a a lot of hats i conduct every year i conduct Mm -hmm. tuba christmas so i totally know what you go through oh so yeah (laughs) right right you commit you get everybody to commit to those christmas tunes at the same ferocious level i had i need no i need you guys to buy in do you hate christmas this is making me sad the uh no i i this year i was on the podium and i realized it was like a silent night you know the repeat it's like supposed to be piano the most ironic version of silent yeah it's and, and and I and I was giving I was giving 350 tubas in the main hall of the Kennedy Center. I was giving them the hand, and I, while I was conducting, I literally had to try to not laugh. And Phil Frankie is always right in front of me, and if I he has like this spidey sense where if I find something funny, even if I'm not showing it, he looks right at me and makes eye contact because he's like I can make him crack. And uh, and I had this thought that that giving the hand to 350 tubas is the exact same sensation and thought process as pushing the closed door button on an elevator <laughs> where you do it because you're like, this time is going to be different. And then you do it and it's like, and then you do it a few times and then you're like, and then you just have like, you're disappointed in yourself. You're like, why? Yeah. Come on, dude, where are you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is your next program that you're conducting? Our next wind ensemble program is a mixture of all kinds of things, keeping along this line of exploring diverse music. We are playing a piece called Festivo by Vaclav Nelly Bell, an old school favorite of mine that works really great for my band. A piece called Ancient Flower by Yukiko Nishimura, a Japanese American composer. And then we have a piece called Night on Fire by John Mackey. This is a piece that my the members of the Wind Ensemble actually voted on. So every semester, I give them the chance to suggest pieces, which I whittle down into a list of finalists, and they essentially get to vote on one piece for every semester. So that's their choice. And then we are playing a piece called Corral and Shaker Dance by Jean, John Zedeklik, another classic standard piece from the 70s, I believe, a piece called Ash by Jennifer Jolly, which she is writing about wildfires in, which she wrote about wildfires in California. And then the last piece, which was one I just ran across because somebody posted it on Facebook one day. It's called A Mother of a Revolution by Omar Thomas. And this is a piece that's written in honor of the LGBTQ Stonewall Uprising event that was led by Marsha Pay It Forward, I think her last name is Johnson. And the piece is all about that. It's all about celebrating that event and celebrating the 
well, essentially following along with the yearly celebrations that now occur with that. And so the goal with the program is just to try to connect with a lot of different people, a lot of different experiences. And we've only really just started working on this program, but I'm very excited to see where we'll go with it. Hmm. So how do you have, uh, how big is your teaching studio? My teaching studio at Hendrix is is very small. We primarily serve in the music department. We primarily serve non-music majors. So mm-hmm. I just have one trombonist and one euphonimist in my low brass teaching studio right now. Mm-hmm. So I would say that the main part of my job is really to be the uh, the band director here. Although I will say one of the things I've started doing just this semester is also going up to a school called Arkansas Tech University, which is in Russellville, Arkansas. And I'm now serving as their adjunct tuba professor which was something they asked me to do, something that I was interested in doing because I am really enjoying the studio teaching aspect of things. So that's where I am kind of in totality with my low brass studio these days. You set up my question beautifully. Thank you for doing so. And that is, how do you balance all of this? You have uh, quite a full plate because being a a director of bands or band director at a a Mm -hmm. college is a full-time undertaking. And then you've Mm -hmm. mentioned your teaching studio here and then at Arkansas tech, as well mm-hmm. as this, uh, the brass band and mm-hmm. as well as I'm sure, uh, clinic schedule and recitals and the like. So how, how do you balance all of that? <laughs> very, very carefully. It's a <laughs> lot of planning and to do lists and trying to recognize when are the days or the periods of time when I'll be particularly busy and what do I need to do to work ahead. And all of that trying to balance too with the idea of having a personal life and spending time with my husband. So there are, there are so many things. Weirdo. I know, you know, right. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want to stay married or something? I, it is a goal of mine. Yes. <laughs> it is I think a that's goal a goal of both of ours. So <laughs> <laughs> easier if it's for both of yours. Yes. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll... Yeah. That's very true. So it, it, it is, it is very challenging. And there are times when I, I feel that um, I am uh, stretched too thin or perhaps uh, have already hit the breaking point, but I'm constantly trying to evaluate and decide, okay, can I actually keep doing all of the things that I'm doing right now? Do I need to pare back in some way? And I just keep trying to rebalance as opportunities come along to rebalance. Well, let's stay with that. So we, how, how frequently are you reevaluating and, and balancing out that portfolio of time? Oh, I'm pretty much on, I mean, I'm at least thinking about it on at least a weekly basis as I'm thinking about what's coming up mm-hmm. for this week. And then perhaps one of the next thoughts is, oh man, what did I do to myself? And how is this all going to happen? And <laughs> what have those I done? Kinds of, <laughs> exactly. What have I done? Those kinds of thoughts. And then if I, if I keep having those certain kinds of feelings about certain of the activities that I'm doing, like this one thing, man, I'm just not getting as much fulfillment out of it, or I just am having a hard time being fully prepared for this commitment all the time. And then I start looking for opportunity for me to gracefully and professionally step away from that particular thing. So those are the kinds of questions that I'm asking myself. And sometimes there's not a way to step away from those things, at least, you know, for a while into the future. And then it's just a, honestly, a lot of what's happened for me over the last few years is a continual process of becoming more and more efficient about every single thing that I'm doing, whether that is quite honestly, getting better at score study uh, is a process that I've gotten faster at over the last few years. It's also helped now by the fact that since this is year five for me, I can now start going back and repeating some pieces that I did in, in my first year, which is really helpful. I still have to go back and study and relearn them, but it's a different process because there's already a baseline familiarity level. So that I think is a lot of what's been happening over the last few years, how to become just so incredibly efficient with everything uh, as much as I possibly can. Here's a, a, a follow-up. Uh, you have decided that you want to let go of a, a commitment like this. Mm-hmm. I, this is no longer uh, providing me value or mm-hmm. happiness or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you do that? How do you um, let the person down uh, or let them know like what's the process like? Because that's a mm-hmm. hard that's a hard thing mm-hmm. to do. We uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's I don't know if anybody feels like they're good at it. Like how do you say no to a thing? How do you get mm-hmm. out of a thing in a way that is yeah. uh, not uh, that is appropriate or that is respectful. Mm-hmm. Well, I I think I feel comfortable enough sharing a, a very specific circumstance that's happened really here within the last couple of months. So 
I am, as I mentioned, the conductor of the Natural State Brass Band, and that's something I started doing shortly after I got here to the Conway area. And when I got here, I was really very excited about my career path moving forward, really as a conductor. That's kind of how I saw things progressing for me. And then Seraph, like I said, kind of dropped out of the blue for me. Not something I expected or planned on ever getting to do, but then it happened. Now I'm playing a lot with them. I'm out on the road teaching in master classes and private lesson settings beyond the experiences I have at Hendrix. And I'm finding myself really being drawn very strongly to that aspect of things. So what the the thought process that was happening a lot throughout the fall 2019 semester was, okay, I'm noticing my passions and my interests shifting a little bit more specifically towards tuba playing and the private lesson teaching and master classes, those types of things. What can I do that would help these outside professional development activities that I do? What would help me make sure I align those things with these developing interests and passions? So as I'm thinking about this, I'm getting phone calls from Arkansas Tech. They are in need, they were in need of an adjunct tuba professor. They initially wanted me to take on the entire tuba studio, which was eight or 10 students, which would require me to go up there about two days a week, which was not something I could take on, especially far, not with it. How far away is it? Uh, about 45 minutes. Um, and so then I, I said, okay, I really would like to do this. I just can't start this spring, but I think if I could shift things around a little bit, I could create the time in my schedule that I could make that something that I, I could do. So as I'm talking to them about this, as I'm trying to figure out um, how to make this all possible, I find myself going back to the brass band and realizing, you know what, I really do enjoy it, but it's not any longer aligning with these developing interests and passions that I have. So in thinking about all of it, I decided that it was time that the time was right for me to step down from serving as the music director of the brass band and then essentially putting in its place time-wise this opportunity to teach at Arkansas Tech, which is more closely aligning with the interests and passions I have these days. So you asked how, how does one deal with that? Well, I asked Arkansas Tech, they wanted me to start in the spring which kind of ended up happening anyway, but that's a little bit of a separate story. Um, I asked Arkansas Tech, would it be possible for me to start next fall? If it's possible for me to start next fall, that gives me the opportunity to more gracefully step away from the brass band, giving them an opportunity to transition directly into their next conductor, as opposed to just you know dropping and, and going away, leaving them in a lurch without a conductor. So it was a lot of kind of thinking about, okay, what kinds of opportunities can I give the brass band to be able to move into their next conductor while also then making it possible for me to take advantage of this opportunity I'm really excited about. So then as I thought about this, it came to uh, came time for a brass band board meeting in December. I called up the board president ahead of the, the board meeting and I essentially told him everything that I just told you. My passions have shifted. I'm trying to make sure things are aligned in this direction. This is what I'd like to do. I'd like to have my last concert happen in May so that the brass band has time to transition smoothly into the next conductor. So it was, you know, what it came down to in this time was just being honest with them about where I was with my kind of career path and then providing a pathway for them to be able to move forward successfully. So long story. Yes, but that's, that's no. how I've dealt with it in this particular time. It's well, then it, it, it's really impressive the way you handled it. And uh, um, not the least of which is that it's my assumption based on what you just said is that as soon as you recognize that this was an issue, then you got in and addressed it and you mm -hmm. didn't just sort of wait and kick it down the road. And then, the monster under the bed gets bigger and more fierce and right. then you have a real problem on your hands. <laughs> right. And right, it, right. It's, it's, it, it almost never pays off to wait. Mm -hmm. you know, just as soon as you know, this is going to be an issue, you better, you better just step up and address it. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too, that was really important, the band has been working really hard and planning for the North American brass band association competition, NABA, which is coming up in March or I'm sorry, April rather. And I knew the last thing I could do was step away from the band, like right then. And what were they going to do? They were so excited about going to NABA this year. So there were a lot of considerations and I mean, it, it kind of comes back to 
what Andrew was asking about, what's what do you like about conducting? Well, it's it's about the community. It's about the culture. And the last thing I wanted to do was leave this community, this culture that I've been working with for the last several years in, in a lurch. I wouldn't want them to be in a position where things are hard. I don't want to see the band have problems or fold or anything like that. So it was as much about caring about the organization beyond my time with them as it was about just my own personal, you know, things that I was trying to work through. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's great. So we're going to ask you, you're, you're, or obviously if anyone did not know you before listening to this, they can tell that you're very thoughtful. So I I think you're going to have some great advice for Jens here in a minute. (laughs) I think it's going to be really good, but I first wanted to share a story. Uh, My wife is a rock star middle school band director here in Fairfax County, Virginia. And uh, she was, uh, this was seven or eight years ago. I don't even remember how she figured this out, but she figured out that she, had John Zdeklik's grandson, granddaughter, I think it was, in her That's band. That's cool. <laughs> and so they, uh, they of course, um, uh, and he was able to fly to DC, and uh, and and so he like worked with the band. They did Corral and Shaker wow. Dance too, and yeah. uh, which is a little easier than the original, and right, um, right. and it's very challenging still for middle school band. But mm-hmm. he like he worked with them over Skype and in person, and yeah, it was like this whole thing. So I thought you would appreciate that. So oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and I of course grew up you know, playing that music, and so then you you know, mm-hmm. and back then it was like, and and now I'm uh, you know as I, I bet we all are, but you know I'm like. I'm uh, I'm friends with John Mackey or with Brian Balmage. Yeah. It's like you know they're yeah. they're um we'll just say they're flawed humans just like the rest of us. But when you're a kid, it's like you know the name on the on the thing. It's like wait, John's I can meet John's dad. Like I was like still yeah. like you know I mean obviously this is just a dude, but I'm just like really like he's coming to your school. Like yeah, it's like all he needed was the address. Yeah, he's coming. Yeah, yeah he's just gonna turn left like everybody else into the parking lot and yeah walk in. So uh, but it was really cool. So and it, mm-hmm. it was and it was obviously incredibly special for him to get to like conduct the band with his granddaughter in it and it was mm-hmm. know, it was very cool so that's yeah. awesome um well mm-hmm. after that heartwarming story now <laughs> let's go complete jackass and then we'll wrap so this is the this is the uh i almost said the boston brass brand that's been a few years here this is not the boston brass um that is uh <laughs> this is the brass junkies it's like our brand the awkward segue to the mouthpiece spot you're getting the full treatment here gretchen mm-hmm. so uh you you know uh for sure by now that our dear friend jens lindeman is uh, is going through some very serious chop problems and mm-hmm. somebody who had realized that they needed to not be in a gig anymore and yet insisted on another gig agreeing to terms so that you could end this other one in the right way to i mean you're you're very thoughtful so <laughs> what advice do you have for jens lindeman in in this desperate time of need hmm well, all I can say is deep breathing, um, perhaps some stretching, and maybe some mouthpiece buzzing, because that's my go-to, so why not? All right, there you go. I like stretching. There is a video uh, on the interwebs of him doing uh, playing with, I believe it's Rhythm and Brass, and uh, at the end, he uh, jumps up in the air and does the splits at the end, ah, yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, except mm-hmm. that he uh, accidentally kicks over a music stand. <laughs> Oh, uh, so awesome. yeah, and mm. he was he was a much younger. I I remember I busted on him about that from the stage at Banff at the brass seminar when he was like he's the guy in charge, and I was busting mm. on him. They were all loving that. The donors were enjoying me. Like, wait, is that okay? Wait, this is funny. So that that clip's got to be old because that was like I was at Banff like almost fifteen years ago. So yeah, it's 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 not an HD, but it's it's quality. So seek it yeah. out. So okay, all right. well, uh, we are going to have Gretchen hang out here for the bonus episode. Thank you so much for talking about that um, about that project, that grant that you got, which is incredible, and hearing mm-hmm. about a little bit about Seraph and a little bit about conducting and a little bit about uh, about studying uh, with Velvet. And uh, yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks again for having me. And for those of you who do not know about our bonus episodes, for every guest we have, uh, we have them stick around and we keep the conversation going, which you can find out more at patreon.com slash the brass junkies. And you can instantly gain access with uh, of a, a ton of bonus episodes with Sam Palafian, with Pat Sheridan, with... Uh, yeah, a lot. I'm only thinking of tuba players all of a sudden, but uh, but there are non tuba player Jim Pandolfi. Uh, yeah, there's 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 a lot. They we we go back to 
Um, geez, there's been like 40 of them now. There's a, there's a lot of back bonus episodes and you get access to all of them as soon as you sign up. So go ahead and head over to Patreon to find out about that. And Lance, is there anything else I'm forgetting? No. Right. <laughs> and so that is going to do it for another episode of The Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Lidl. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.